Hey everybody, Ariel241, we're back at it, week two, lesson one. Um, I'm trying a new method for recording. I'm using Panopto, which some of you may be using in other courses, other professors may be using. Um, it's a little bit simpler to use for, um, for recording purposes. Uh, also, I'm not going to edit much of it, so there might still be some weird things like there were in the last couple of videos, but we'll see. Um, so, any, I'm trying to think of any housekeeping to cover. First thing, um, so I am using Panopto. You'll look different when you click on, when you log in to um, check week two videos in the folder. There'll be uh, these Panopto videos that give you a sort of, that'll link to the Panopto player in your browser that shows you me and the slides and two little screens. Um, I'll also download them out of Panopto and put them back on, upload them on the YouTube channel. Um, that way, if you're using a phone or a tablet or something that might be, harder to display the Panopto um, player, you can watch them that way. And if you watch it that way, it'll be one screen with me like tiny in the bottom the whole time. Um, so that should work. Um, so not a big change, a little change. Um, I'm trying to think of anything else. I haven't graded anything yet. I don't think there's been any work turned in. Maybe a couple things here or there. Um, but this is Thursday uh, afternoon as I'm recording this. So um, I expect work to start coming in the next few days because all everything is due on Sunday. So I will post this as soon as it's done. So it could be up, you know, by the weekend. And if you want to go ahead and get a head start on week two, go for it. All right. Um, I think that's it. Um, okay. So we're moving into the second week um, of content for this new schedule. And we're looking at really the early 20th century. We're going to talk about kind of uh, and again, there's so much happening right now that we could talk about. There's so much going on. Um, but rather than try to cover everything, I'm going to pull out a few, a couple stories. Um, the first story we're going to look kind of today is thinking about what becomes known as the Protestant, uh, the uh, fundamentalist and modernist split in American Protestantism, which I think is important because it sets up what happens later on um, in the late 20th century and even up to today. Um, and then we'll talk on the second lesson for this week. Uh, we're going to look at uh, after this World War II, um, the 1950s, and a kind of American nationalism and religious nationalism that comes up um, in lesson two. So that's where we're headed. So today, uh, here are our topics, the roots of fundamentalism. So a couple examples, revivalism, dispensationalism, fundamentalism itself, modernism, uh, and then the Scopes trial. If you haven't read chapter... 14 in this book you need to this book is becoming more and more important um, as I'm doing shorter lectures um, And we're not having as much discussion and stuff to work into read chapter 14 start there um, And we're going to kind of pull some examples out of that chapter to talk about today All right, so that's where we're headed So let's start with Billy Sunday. Um, so you read about Billy Sunday uh, He read from Billy Sunday a part of his sermon one of his sermons um, and you'll see in that, I wrote here four kind of things we can think about Billy Sunday. Billy Sunday, he was a former baseball player who had a conversion experience. And if we think back to that Protestant consensus we talked about last week, um, Sunday is coming out of a part of that consensus, which was um, this, the, driven by uh, this emphasis. You can see even the bottom down here, this picture, it says, it's up to you. He would lean over when he was preaching Billy Sunday, this revivalist preacher. Um, he would lean over and say things like that. He was a former baseball player who had a conversion experience, became a minister, a preacher, and toured around the Midwest preaching a very raucous, active, move around the room, move around the stage um, approach. And you could see in, his, in the reading we had on page 397, 398, where he talks about, especially 398, where he talks about... Um, the kind of individualism of it, it's all about you. If you go through this, he's preaching to you. He's looking at you. You can see him looking across there. It's up to you, it says at the bottom, right? This individual uh, message. It's not a message for all of society. It's not a message to save the world. It's not a message to end poverty. It's not a message to deal with uh, the, the industrialization that's coming over America. It's a message for you. And that's what you get here, right? And it's a message of conversion. So you look in the middle of 398. So he says he has something better for you. Salvation, if he can get you to see it. You've kept your church membership locked up. You smiled at a smutty story. When God and the church were scoffed at, you never peeped. And when asked to stand up, you sneaked out the back way and beat it. 
you're afraid, and God despises a coward, a mutt. You cannot be converted by thinking so and sitting still. Then he goes on, right, to talk about conversion. Uh, He says above that, he talks about believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, right? So he has this whole emphasis on kind of individual conversion, and then it's an emphasis on on simplicity. Um, On that same page, a little farther down, he says, Jesus said, come to me, not to the church, to me, not to a creed, to me, not to a preacher, to me, not to the evangelist, to me, not to a priest, to me, not to a pope. Come to me and I will give you rest. It's on page 398. Faith in Jesus Christ saves you, not faith in the church. This simple message of Jesus, conversion, right? And then follows it up with an emphasis on moral living, right? He says, maybe you're a drunkard, an adulterer, a prostitute, a liar, won't admit you are lost or proud, right? So there's this emphasis on kind of, it's a very simple message of individual conversion, individual moral living, individual action, right? And we're going to see that's a contrast. And this is, you know, uh, Sunday is uh, converted in the 1880s, uh, and he's a kind of um, paves the way for the kind, and, and is very much identifies as a fundamentalist later on in his career, but is going to pave the way for the kind of fundamentalism that we're going to see in the, in the teens, 20s, and the 30s. Okay, so that's Sunday. Um, as one example sort of where this is going, you can see it in this sermon you read. Um, uh, so I encourage you to go back and look at that carefully. On the other end, this is this is him. Uh, I talked about how active he is. Um, Billy Sunday, noted evangelist. Uh, I actually put a link. Uh, this is another. This is a drawing of him standing athwart and pointing to the audience. And the audience there, you can see down here, women uh, fainting. Um, and. Uh, I actually posted a link on Blackboard that's worth looking at if you want to see more about Sunday, uh, about his um, visit just to one town in Richmond, uh, Indiana. Indiana? Or Illinois? I can't remember. Um, But it talks about his uh, style of revivalism and and the revivals that he had there in town. Um, And it's kind of an interesting, has interesting pieces from the uh, newspapers there. But you can see the large crowd in this picture, right? Um, So that's Billy Sunday, Um, and I think he's one example of what's going on in this kind of linkage between where we left off and where we're headed and the the break that's about to come, because a lot of his attack, right, if you think about it in that that sermon, a lot of his attack is on the church, capital C, that there's a difference between the church and real Christianity, and a a critique he has of of ministers. uh, of certain kinds of ministers that are going to come to be known as the modernists that, that he sees are, are too focused on other things besides getting people saved and getting them to live good moral lives individually, right? So this is kind of setting the stage where we're headed. The other thing that sets the stage is dispensationalism. So dispensationalism, this picture here is Cyrus Schofield, and Cyrus Schofield uh, wrote the or, or published the Schofield Reference Bible, which is a Bible with his particular notes on how to interpret it. Um, and it's still used to this day by people. Um, uh, and Schofield uh, involved, uses a literal and symbolic reading of the Bible, as I say here. And what dispensationalism, where it gets its name, is it divides the Bible into various periods of time or dispensations, um, sometimes five, sometimes seven. Um, and the idea was you can understand biblical history and actually predict the future and the, the second coming of Jesus. We talked about that. And this premillennialism, right? This is a coming before the millennium, coming before that millennium of peace. We talked about that, remember? Uh, by dividing the Bible up into these different ages, so sort of the age of Adam and Eve, the age of Noah, the age of Abraham, the age, uh, and and the right now, uh, uh, during the during this during Schofield's time and our own time, we're living in the age of the church, and there God deals in this reading of, of the Bible. God deals with people differently in the different ages, the different dispensations. Um, so it's a very complicated uh, system, but it's a systematic, uh, literal reading of the Bible that also draws on symbolism, right? Um, uh, in some interest, in some very specific ways. Let me give you another example. Uh, there's, a, there's a man named Clarence Larkin, 
who would do charts, dispensationalist charts. So this right here is one of his charts. And you can see you have the creative ages, right? The eternity of time that existed before God, God creates the earth. You have the antediluvian age, which has the Edenic, the Edenic dispensation. So this is the Eden, right? Then the antediluvian dispensation, antediluvian meaning before the deluge, before the flood, right? And then here's the flood. There's the boat. There's the ark, literally. And then you have the present age, which involves various dispensations. So you have the Noah to Abraham, the Abraham to Moses, then the Mo which is, and these have different names. So this is the post-diluvian, the patriarchal, and then you get the legal dispensation, which is Moses to Christ, which is like the Old Testament, most of the Old Testament, right? Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, all that. And then the first coming of Jesus, right? There's a whole lot of other stuff connected to that we won't dive into. And then the church dispensation in here, right? Uh, and we have yet to come, the ages of ages, the future time. We'll have the millennial age, which has the messianic dispensation. This is the millennium. The second coming comes. There's the second coming, right? And now we get the messianic thousand years. And then we have the final judgment. And then we have the perfect age. So there's a whole, and then the eternity, the omega. So you have... Um, a kind of timeline with eternity on either side of it, right? Um, and there's a whole lot in here where there's Bible verses if you want to, um, right? But this is dividing it up into these six uh, ages before and two ages after, two, two uh, sorry, excuse me, six dispensations before and two dispensations after uh, Christ's second coming. And you can see there's a whole lot of stuff going on here as well. Um, if you look more carefully, um, depending on how big your screen is. Um, I love these charts. I love these charts. This is the 7,000 years of human history um, that he also uh, divides up into the seven days of creation, right? Um, in this kind of interesting way. And this, again, is a literal reading. So here we're talking about 7,000 years, meaning that human beings have only been around 7,000 years, right? Meaning that... Um, uh, or 6,000 years at this point, because he has the he has the Antichrist on here and the end of Satan. This is the millennium age, the seventh day, the day of the Sabbath, right? So if you go back, that traditional reading of scripture that reads it literally, it says the world is, six, the, the earth is 6,000 some odd years old. He's pointing that out and going with it and pointing towards eventually a second coming that'll mark a seventh day. The seventh day is the day that God rests in the New Testament, right? Um, so you have, the, this says the creative week, and he map, maps it out. So on that seventh day, the 7,000th year the, will be the millennium, the, the millennium of peace. So Larkin is taking um, the, uh, this is from 1918, you can see down here. So Larkin is taking the, my dishwasher is going off again this time, taking the uh, dispensationalist reading of folks like Schofield and charting it out. Um, this is another one on the second coming, and here he has more uh, a reading of Daniel in the book of Revelation. Um, I won't spend a lot of time on this one. But you get a sense of how Larkin and, and Schofield is doing this in his notes, the way he's reading the scriptures and interpreting them and offering footnotes in his Bible. So the Schofield Study Bible has these extensive footnotes about how to read um, these sections, how to interpret them. Um, and Larkin's doing this in, in chart form. I actually put a link, um, in, so under the videos in the video folder on Blackboard, there's two links. There's one to that Billy Sunday article I talked about, and then there's a link to this website that has all of Larkin's charts. So if you're curious, if you want to look at it, um, I've always wanted someone to figure out a chart to write, do their own chart as part of an essay or something. But, um, but that's there. Okay, so that's Larkin. And so these two, the dispensational reading, um, along with folks like Billy Sunday and this kind of simplified old-time religion that emphasizes moral behavior, that rejects uh, uh, Sunday, rejected evolution, rejected science, leads to what becomes known as fundamentalism. Um, and fundamentalism gets its name not until 1910 to 1915, when there's a published, this is the background picture here, the series of, of kind of academic journals called the Fundamentals. And the Fundamentals were theological tracts, theological treatises, that attempted to, to defend 
what they saw as the fundamentals of Christianity over and against uh, changes that the so-called modernists wanted to make. And we'll talk about modernism in a second. So it emerges from the discourse that's around dispensationalism and the dispensationalist approach to reading scripture, both symbolically on the one hand and literally on the other and how it interprets them. But then it's also um, tied up with a kind of Billy Sunday style rejection of science, emphasis on the individual, emphasis on individual conversion. Um, and, and in some ways it's this move in the fundamentals to claim to, you, re, you, you make the, the rhetoric is we're, we're going to defend what is the fundamental truth or defend what is really at the heart of Christianity, but it's actually producing something new in that process, right? So there's this paradox of the rhetoric is rhetoric of, of going back to the old, of, of saving what's old and always been there, but it's actually quite different, right? Um, because the thing they're doing is new, right? So when you hear about, this is why I don't like the term like fundamentalist Islam or Hindu fundamentalism, because the term fundamentalism has its birth in this period, 1910, 1915, amongst the people who are uh, championing this work that's done in the fundamentals. They were funded actually by an oil, uh, a giant oil magnate funded the publication of them. Um, and they're... Um, they were written by theology professors. So the fun, we, we often think of fundamentalism as a religion of kind of like in America, fundamentalist Christianity is like backwoods yokels or those who aren't educated or, or are ignorant or reject education and intellectualism. But uh, as we'll see in a second, and as you read from uh, Mainstream, like the, it was Princeton theology professors writing these things. It was very well educated. And it started out as an intellectual movement and it only became, it, it then appealed to folks like Billy Sunday who were out there in the Midwest preaching in tents full of people. And so there's a kind of populist fundamentalism that becomes, that grows, but it starts as an intellectual movement and as an intellectual argument between educated ministers and theologians um, across the country. So it, fundamentalism is a, offers a literal reading of the Bible. It re, uh, rejects evolution, rejects science, uh, an individual, a, a premillennial second coming. And the second coming, as you read in chapter 14 of this book, uh, the second coming, whether it's an actual physical second coming of Jesus, like we see in the Larkin charts, a historical event, or whether it's a metaphor for a larger kingdom of God, on kingdom of heaven or kingdom of God on earth, uh, as we'll see modernists interpret it, um, becomes a kind of a litmus test, I think is how they put it in the book, right? Um, the fundamentalists believe there will be a historical moment of Jesus' second coming, uh, and it will be before the millennium, and it will change things, and we can chart it, right? Um, that's not how the modernists are going to see it. Um, we'll see. And what you, the, the fundamentalists, the other thing that's not on here is it is this emphasis on the individual, on individual conversion, on individual change, and, and, and a real lack of interest in larger social change, structural change, answering modern questions about society and industry and business that are happening in this period. Um, and a real emphasis on just individual conversion um, as the goal of Christianity, which we've seen before, right? That's not new. I mean, of conscience, all of this kind of thing. Um, and so you can kind of read the fundamentalist modernist split one way is as a distinction between those who are emphasizing individual experience, conscience, conversion, and then individual morality after that, versus those who are emphasizing structural changes, larger questions of order in society, how do you structure a good society, right? That kind of structure, that kind of difference. So if you have fundamentalism on the one hand, we have modernism on the other. This is a, 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 on the left-hand side of that, I have a, the title page from one of these sorts, uh, Harry Emerson Fosdick, at Union Theological Seminary, Union, one of the most li more liberal seminaries in the country at that time and even now. Um, and this is from 24. Uh, modernism didn't read the Bible literally. Instead, they, they used, they read the Bible, what's been called the historical or historical critical method, which sees the Bible as a pr product of its historical moment. It still sees it as special, still sees it as a source of authority, but its interpretation has to be tempered by an understanding of its historical moment. You cannot... Uh, just pull a Bible verse out out of context and use it interpreted alone as many literal and 
as you can see on those charts, the dispensationalist, fundamentalist, literal reading does, right? Um, there's, a, there's a great meme I saw one day. I can do all things through a Bible verse taken out of context. That's kind of what the literalism allows. Is like if I can find a verse to cite, right? And we saw that with the slavery argument. This emphasis on the, the when, when the Bible talks about slavery, we can go and look at that and we can defend both sides. Now we're taking a move... Uh, and the, I said German high criticism, German, uh, German scholars of the Bible were the ones who really opened this up. And it comes over the United States in the late 19th century and really picks up steam in the early 20th century. And so we're going to read the books of the Bible in the historical, in their historical context. Right? We're going to and, and interpret them in light of the world around them at that time. So that allows things to be said, oh, that was just the way it was in that time. That's not authoritative for our time, right? Um, and it allows a distinction to be made interpretation between what is cultural, or historical, and what is kind of eternal. Uh, uh, uh. Now, that's a similar move between how we literally versus symbolically interpret the Bible if you're a fundamentalist, right? So everyone's making, the, the key here is there's no like best way to interpret a text. These are different strategies and they come into context, and the different strategies are used by different people to achieve different ends, right? So uh, there's this so this historical critical reading. So for example, they may look at they look at Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the four Gospels, and they re recognize that well, Mark was written first, and Mark borrow and Matthew and Luke borrow things from Mark, and they borrow things from each other. Uh, John is written last, and it's very different; it has a whole different feel to it, right? So they separate those three. First three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, call them the synoptics because they're more story. And then you have the John Gospel separate and forth, right? So you can have these kinds of approaches um, that pay more attention to the historical uh, and treat the Bible as a historical text, but still give it authority and still see it as useful uh, for modern Christianity. They also saw science and Christianity as, uh, that says comparable, should say compatible, I'm going to edit that while I'm sitting here. If I can do that. Compatible. Compatible. Uh, meaning they can work together, right? That nothing in Christianity is going to conflict with science. Nothing in science necessarily conflicts with Christianity. So evolution opens up a new way to interpret uh, the story in Genesis of the seven-day creation. And that seven-day creation is no longer read literally, as God makes the world in seven days, but it's read uh, as a kind of allegory, as a, as a symbol, as a myth, that it's describing other things. Um, and, and so there's some way to put these things together. Um, the, that really, that truth is universal, and so scientific truth and Christian truth can be, will always lead to the same place, right? This is the argument. Uh, and they also, as opposed to being some worried about individual conversion, individual morality, they're much more interested in these modern questions like war, right? World War I is just over, uh, is, is happening and is ending during this period. Industrialization, the rampant industrialization, the poverty of the, uh, the both, both the industrialization of the Roaring Twenties and then later the poverty of the Great Depression. Questions of justice, um, the modernists will become the more liberal mainline churches that will become invested in the civil rights movement. We'll see you later next week. Um, but questions of justice and equality. And the argument is that the kingdom of God is in this world, not the next world. So where all those charts want to mark second coming of Christ and then a millennium of peace, the modernists are saying, no, 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 we have to build that millennium here. We have to use the Bible as a guide for solving these modern questions by reading it historically, and then build a kingdom of heaven here on earth now. They're very much interested in reform, change, uh, uh, progress in this world uh, in a way that the fundamentalists are not. They're like, this world is terrible. It's going to hell in a handbasket. We're going to have to do our best to be good moral people in the meantime, and then we'll die, or Jesus come back, and we'll be in heaven, and then that's when it really starts, right? So there's this real difference in how they approach social issues. Uh, this is a, an example of the, uh, mo the fundamentalist attack on modernism often came through these wonderful cartoons. Uh, you can see here the descent of the modernists as they start off at the top as just a normal person. And there's Christianity, 
Bible not infallible, that's a reference to that higher criticism. Man not made in God's image, that's a reference to evolution. No miracles, no virgin birth, no deity, no atonement, no resurrection, agnosticism. By the time you get to the bottom, he's gone from a regular guy to a professor, a theology professor, the worst kind. Um, and he's stepping on the last step, which is atheism. So although fundamentalism starts in the 1910s teens as an intellectual movement, it soon, by the 20s, becomes very anti-intellectual, very, uh, and the, and Sunday, Billy Sunday is a great example as he would preach against, he's called seminaries, the places where ministers got cold enough to become preachers, right? That they were there, there to chill and, 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 and ruin people before they could actually become real Christian preachers, right? So there's this real skepticism of seminary learning, of book learning, of intellectualism that comes up as we move forward in, in the fundamentalist movement. This is a great, another great one. It has a quote, if you look at it, so it's got a waterfall. Uh, and it has um, at the bottom a verse from Jeremiah. My people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and have and hewed them out cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. So you have the fountain of living waters, this beautifully drawn waterfall on the left-hand side. On the right-hand side, you have the cistern of modernism that is broken with sin, sinful pleasure, sin, unbelief, worldliness. And here, this is the vision of a big, fancy, mainline, Protestant, modern church, right? Um, of which all of this modernism has proven to be just an empty well, right? That's all that's run dry. Last one here. Um, you have world distress. So this is the world, the sick, sick world. Um, and they've taken ethical culture, modernism, world friendship, reform, right? Pacifism, all of these isms, right? Uh, that they've tried to take the medicine for. Here's your consultation of smart, le book learned theologian, theological professors. And what's the real prescription? God's prescription for the world's sin sickness. The blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. 1 John 1 7. So you have this uh, idea that the simple, uh, individual salvation will save the world, not reform, not changing the structures, not modernism, not world friendship, some sort of world get along, pacifism, none of that. No, no, no. What we need is scripture. This is the neglected remedy, right? Uh, a very particular literal reading of scripture that emphasizes individual salvation. So there's a lot happening in that one, commercial, that one uh, cartoon. So you read um, for this week two different, uh, one of each here, a fundamentalist and a, and a, and a whoop, I should say Protestant, I should say modernist. Let's fix that too. Versus Protestants. They're all Protestants. Everyone's Protestant here. Let's fix that. All right. Proofread people. All right, so on the left, uh, you have J. Gresham Machen, the fundamentalist, who you read from. And on the right, you have Shaler Matthews, the modernist. And um, go read the whole thing. Machen was really the one of the real deep thinkers, crafters of fundamentalism. Matthews was one of the modernists that was defending modernism against the fundamentalist attacks. Um, I have two quotes here I just want to use to get to kind of um, talk about this. Mason says, on the one hand, our principal concern, this is the fundamentalist, just now is to show that the liberal attempt at reconciling Christianity with modern science has really relinquished everything distinctive of Christianity. So Mason's argument was, if you uh, give everything away to accommodate science, to accommodate modernity, to accommodate modernism, you've got no Christianity left. You've given it all away. There's nothing distinctive about Christianity. You've just accepted all of modern culture. And then what do you have? This is his argument. Matthews, on the other hand, says, what then is modernism? This is the very beginning of the, of the, of the piece. And it's a really useful piece to go look at. 
It is not a denomination or a theology. It is the use of the methods of modern science to find, state, and use the permanent and central values of inherited orthodoxy in meeting the needs of the modern world. So a couple of things on that quote, right? You have modern science and you use that to find the permanent and central values of inherited orthodoxy. So orthodoxy meaning right belief, Christian belief. So his argument is you can use science to get at what is truly, truly, truly important in Christianity and then use that to meet the needs of the modern world. Not about the individual, right? This is about the bigger issues, the bigger questions that people are dealing with. Um, so there's also just two very different sets of questions that these two groups are, are arguing over, right? Um, but I think that sums it up well, that it's like, that they're saying, no, 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 Christianity has to adapt, it has to change, it has to bring in understandings from science, uh, and then use those to address all these larger questions. All of this comes to a head in a, an event called the Scopes Trial in 1925, and it happens in Dayton, Tennessee. Dayton, Tennessee has a law that it is illegal to teach evolution in public schools. Uh, a teacher, uh, John Scopes, teaches evolution. He's arrested. And the whole thing is kind of a setup to have this trial, which becomes a national trial of the century, national media moment. The New York Times is sending all these northern... Uh, newspapers and radio stations are sending reporters down to Tennessee. The, the, it just becomes this massive national moment, becomes this um, uh, media circus. Um, and uh, the fundamentalists, uh, the uh, city, uh, I'm sorry, the um, prosecutors in Dayton bring in William Jennings Bryan, a fundamentalist, multi-time presidential candidate, also a populist, William Jennings Bryan um, is kind of like if Bernie Sanders was also a fundamentalist evangelical Christian, right? Anti-big business, uh, 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 anti all the industrial problems that were happening in the 20s. Uh, uh, a man of the people would have totally, he preached a sermon called Cross of Gold. That was this court of, uh, you know, Bryan would also agree that, that there should be no millionaires, like deeply populist deeply uh, uh, aware of social problems in certain ways, but also uh, fundamentalist. So he's a really interesting character, really interesting figure, whole other thing we could do on him. But he's, at this point, quite old. Uh, he was brought in by the prosecutors as a special prosecutor because of his expertise as a fundamentalist. On the other hand, uh, the uh, defense for Scopes brings in Clarence Darrow, a famous uh, agnostic atheist, free thinker, uh, lawyer, um, and uh, and I have their public embarrassment of fundamentalists. In the story, the way it goes, Darrow, in this very interesting moment, puts William Jennings Bryan on the stand as a uh, as a expert on the Bible and begins to to um, to examine him and ask him questions. And he asked some questions about, well, how does there light before God makes the sun? Was Jonah really swallowed by a large fish? And all of these sorts of things. And Brian just can't give him the good answers. Because Brian's not, he's not an expert on the Bible. He's just a good fundamentalist who also is a politician and all these things. And Darrow basically, in, as the story is told by the media who is there, Darrow basically completely embarrasses William Jennings Bryan. And in fact, Brian dies of a stroke days later after the, after the trial. Now, Scopes is found guilty and fined $1. And, and uh, so in, in effect, uh, Scopes loses the case. But in reality, the press and the reports of the story, uh, and you can see this in this, guilt, this cartoon to the side there, the fundamentalists, culturally, the fundamentalists lose. Brian is embarrassed. He dies days later. Uh, fundamentalism, it seems, has run aground in the national consciousness here. And what happens is fundamentalists go underground. So there's still fundamentalists, there's still churches, there's still a whole network of Bible colleges and Bible institutes and publishing houses and radio stations, but they pull out of mainstream culture. They aren't going to fight these battles with the modernists anymore. They're going to go build their own networks. And that's what they do. They build their own networks of missionary agencies, publication houses, and they're well-funded by a number of very rich 
men uh, who have sympathy with them. Um, and they're going to go underground, basically. And they retreat from politics. They retreat from um, national media attention. They're not going to fight any more battles like the Scopes trial. Uh, they've learned their lesson. Now, what happens uh, after World War II in the 40s is they start to come back, but they come back with a new name. They don't want to be called fundamentalists anymore. So we're actually going to talk about them next in the next lesson. Um, but they begin to come back and they can call themselves evangelicals um, uh, as a way to get, they want to keep the fundamentalist theology about individual salvation, morality, um, against large social change, uh, a lot of that stuff. But they're going to get rid of the kind of, uh, as one scholar calls it, the cussedness of fundamentalism. Um, that sense that fundamentalists are mean, mean-spirited, dumb, ignorant, backwoodsy, bunch of Tennessee yokels. They're going to leave all that behind. And so the, the one who does this best is Billy Graham. With his Billy Graham, the, the, Billy Graham has the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association. And he founds the National Association of Evangelicals. He helps found that um, in the 40s. And so they're going to come back with a new branding in the 40s. And then they're going to really come back. Um, again, we'll tell the story as we get there. Uh, when it comes to politics more blatantly uh, in the late 80s, um, in the mid, mid to late 80s, mid 80s with Ronald Reagan. Uh, but we'll get there. We're not there yet. So that's, that's fundamentalism. Um, and that's where we are. That's where we're going to leave off. But this is an interesting, this, this argument that happens sort of sets the stage for a whole different approach to, to, um, to Protestantism for the rest of the century. Uh, the 20th century and the 21st century. All right, that's today's lesson. Go do, make sure you do your re, your primary source grids. Um, if you have questions, if you have problems, I'm here, email me. And otherwise, uh, hang in there, stay safe, wash your hands, don't go outside, like don't go do dumb things, hang out, relax. And um, I hope you're all doing really well. All right, talk to you later. Bye.